Great. All right. Good morning. Thank you for joining me. I hope you can all hear me now. Uh, I want to welcome you to this briefing on the 44th regular meeting of the CARICOM Heads of Government. That meeting is supposed to take place uh, on the 15th and 16th and 17th and 18th of uh, February. Uh, the official opening is the evening of the 15th, which will be at Atlantis. There will be a special meeting of the foreign ministers preceding that official opening, and then the plenary of the conference will take place on the 16th, 17th, ending on uh, Friday the 18th. And we have uh, the heads of government from the CARICOM region. There are 14 nations in CARICOM plus the associated states like Bermuda, uh, the BVI, and um, Montserrat, and the Turks and Caicos Islands, who will all be attending. Um, the special, there's a list of special guests who will be coming in, amongst them uh, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau of Canada, and there will be an address at the start of the conference, the President of Ukraine by video link, uh, President Zelensky. Uh, so this is um, a meeting, set of meetings which takes place, these meetings take place uh, twice a year, once in February and then once on the 4th of July in the summertime. The Bahamas took over the chairmanship of CARICOM under its Prime Minister Philip Brave Davis on the 1st of January, and his chairmanship will expire on the 4th of July when he hands over to Dominica. Uh, we expect um, an exciting conference. Uh, there's a special delegation of American uh, government officials coming in, uh, headed by Brian Nichols, who's the Under Secretary of State for Western Hemisphere and including John Kerry, who is a special representative of the United States President, and John Dodd, former s senator, and who is also a special representative of the U.S. President. And they will be here for the duration of the conference. Uh, joining us will also be uh, representatives from Korea, South Korea, because they are campaigning for the support of CARICOM countries for the vote at the Bureau of International Expositions in Paris for the exposition in the year 2030. Uh, the Assistant Director General of the Food and Agricultural Organization will also be coming, as will the um, Secretary General of the uh, World Trade Organization, and um, that will be a, a very important visitor. The President of the AFRI uh, Import Export Bank will also be coming. And some 40 or so ambassadors will be visiting uh, during that time. So there will be a range of bilateral meetings taking place in the margins of the meeting. Uh, we hope to put the best foot forward of the country. And uh, security, of course, will be a key issue given the number of important visitors that, that will be in town. And we want to show them the best of our country. Uh, have the ability to move around our country freely uh, without having security concerns, so we'll be trying to take a great deal of effort and care uh, in that. Uh, I want to congratulate the Prime Minister uh, for his assumption of office, and I'm sure he will uh, carry out the job with his usual aplomb, and we Reporting expect a, a successful conference. So, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. So, the Prime Minister, in an address at the Outlook Seminar, which took place at the start of the year, laid out his priorities for in foreign affairs. And the major priority is the issue of climate change. So he has said, and has been traveling around the world, beating the bushes on this subject, because for the Bahamas, climate change is existential. And that means quite simply this. The sea level is rising around the world. And in the Bahamas, 80% of the land is within three meters of the sea. So that means that if there is sea level rise, the country will disappear or as he says, we'll either be uh, refugees, climate change refugees, or die in a watery grave. That's the stark reality of what is happening. 
So we need to have a couple of things done. Money is the key issue. Money for adaptation and mitigation and money for uh, loss and damage. And these are front and center uh, on the international stage. Uh, the government of the United Arab Emirates is sending their representative, their Minister for International Development is coming. Uh, that's where the COP28 is going to be in Dubai in the winter. And again, these, th these two subjects, loss and damage, mitigation and adaptation will be front and center. And what you're trying to do is to lobby the world to provide the funding to deal with these issues. We are not major emitters, but we are suffering the consequences of the emissions in the air. And we are trying to our best to uh, keep our heads above water, pardon the pun, uh, but uh, it takes money to do so. And he's indicated, the Prime Minister has indicated that almost 50% of our national debt is due to climate factors. So we would have been 50% better off had those events not occurred. And that is a very serious figure. Um, the latest uh, estimates I see this morning is an $11 billion national debt. So that means 50% of that, 6.6 .6 million and some, or about 6 million and some, 5.5 million and some, uh, due to climate change factors and trying to recover from these events uh, when they take place. So climate change, number one. Number two, Haiti. Uh, you know that Haiti has been descending into chaos as a result of the collapse of their political system. Uh, and the countries of the world have been trying to see, and in this hemisphere, trying to see what we can do to help. The United States has been at front and center of this, and that's part of the reason why they're bringing such a large delegation, the Bahamas being 90 miles to the north of Haiti. Uh, and being the transit passage for uh, Haitians on their way to the United States. Um, the U.S. has been trying to s find ways to solve the political situation in Haiti and to improve the uh, security in that country. So that's the second issue. Uh, the Canadians have agreed uh, to take the lead in trying to resolve uh, some of these problems, and so that's why Justin Trudeau is coming here. Uh, for discussions with our Prime Minister. Both Jamaica and the Bahamas have agreed to provide manpower if the United Nations decides that there is a force to go into Haiti again. And the question is, how will those modalities be handled? Uh, we obviously do not have uh, the manpower which is required to undertake such an exercise, but we want to contribute to it, and uh, we want to contribute to a solution. Uh, so. The developed countries, both uh, United States, uh, Canada, the EU, uh, France in particular, have been speaking to CARICOM about whether or not we support what is being proposed and uh, whether or not we can work with them or take the lead in trying to resolve the political issues which have to be resolved before any solution can obtain in Haiti. So those are the two major things. And then some of the other issues will be food security. As you know, um, Cindy McCain, Ambassador Cindy McCain, just visited the Bahamas to see what we're doing on those issues, and there's a lot of support coming on that. Uh, and then se secondly, energy security. Uh, part of what our problems are for development is the fact that uh, energy supply is so expensive in the Caribbean region, and we need to take steps to try and see how we can resolve those problems. Apart from that, there will be all of the um, international financial agencies will be in town, as well as uh, the affiliated bodies like the University of the West Indies will be coming to give their reports to the heads of government about where their various agencies are. So this will be a very intense couple of days. Um, my question is, for those who may not understand, what is the significance of the Bahamas being a part of, of the CARICOM body? Well, uh, there are 14 of us and less than 20 million people. In a world of 9 billion people, that's very small. You have 192 countries in the United Nations. So the question is, how do you relate to the outside world? 
the more efficient way of dealing with the outside world is as a group or as a region. So in the United Nations, the world is divided into regions. And the region of which we are part is called Latin America and the Caribbean. So we've just come from a meeting called CELAC, where all of the countries in Latin America and the Caribbean meet as a region to discuss what our aims and objectives are. This is now the sub-regional meeting, which is the CARICOM countries, largely the English-speaking Caribbean plus Haiti. And when you meet the world, you meet the world as a group. So it is very difficult for an individual country of 45,000 like you have in St. Kitts or 400,000 here in the Bahamas to meet these countries. So this is the best and most efficient way to do so. And in a world where these things in international bodies are decided by votes, our votes count. And people come here to lobby. And because this is a large block, 14 countries, um, it's an important meeting uh, which takes place. So I've often said to our own population, if CARICOM did not exist, it would have to be invented because it's simply the most efficient way for all of these small countries to deal with the outside world. Hi, Marlena Leonard, Our News. Um, it seems like this CARICOM meeting in particular is becoming more of a, a broader international meeting as opposed to a regional meeting, like you were saying, some of the special guests that are coming. Um, specifically with Canada and the U.S., is there any concern that with some of these larger, more developed countries that the dynamic might shift a little bit in discussions um, just because they're far more influential on the global stage usually, or do you think it'll stay the same as far as regional leaders staying true to, to what they're coming there for? Um, well, the beauty of this type of meeting and the relationships which uh, we have engendered over the months and years is that this is part of a continuing conversation. So um, it is an opportunity to get face to face to discuss matters which would have dis been discussed at an ambassadorial level uh, or um, at a technical level. But this is where the heads of government, the people who actually make the decisions, get to meet. And that's the importance to the world leaders who are coming is to find out face to face what is the view of the actual leaders of the country, quite apart from the technical people or the ambassadors or the ministers of foreign affairs. Uh, so I don't think the dynamic is going to change, but you know it makes a difference when you're meeting face to face. So you have the President of the United States sending his special envoys to the Bahamas to speak to the heads and to speak to the foreign ministers to say, here's what we're thinking about a particular issue. What do you think? And I think that that informs their policy going forward. Uh, what is clear, for example, on Haiti is that uh, none of the developed countries, given the recent experience of their interventions in uh, Port-au-Prince, have the appetite for going in without the support of the CARICOM region. Uh, reputationally, many of the countries uh, suffered. Uh, Brazil, for example, uh, had such a bad experience with Haiti that they've just said, this is not something that we think we want to do again. And so many countries have said, well, what Haiti is part of CARICOM, what is your view about this? And uh, our view <laughs> is that this, is, this has got to be a Haitian solution. This cannot be imposed on the outside. As painful as it is, uh, it must be a Haitian-led solution. Nobody can impose on them what can happen there in their society. So that's the message which is going to be reinforced. At the same time, there are things we can do, like we can strengthen the Haitian National Police. We can take steps to strengthen their economy. Uh, so that's what the discussion will center around. And I think we're basically at Edom on all of these matters. But it makes a difference, you know, to hear face to face what uh, what the leaders are are thinking, and um, it is uh, one of the it's a relatively rare opportunity because I said it only happens every six months that people actually get together at this point, and uh, and I think uh, it will 
uh, lead to very good outcomes in terms of the international uh, policies. Mr. Mitchell, just for clarity, <coughs> can you give, I guess, a number of delegates that are expected to be here just for clarity, please? Uh, I can't say what the total number of delegates will be, but there are 14 countries, uh, CARICOM, plus there are expected to be, uh, there are five associated states, but f I think four are going to be represented here. I believe that uh, uh, the Cayman Islands will not be coming this time, and Anguilla will not be coming. But uh, British Virgin Islands, Bermuda, uh, Turks and Caicos, uh, Montserrat will be here. Um, in terms of the Bermuda, the Turks and Caicos, and uh, the British Virgin Islands, Bahamas has a special interest, uh, as does CARICOM generally, but because we are closer to them than all the others. We have a special interest in the continuation of their internal democracy. Uh, you would know that when the Constitution was suspended by the British in the Turks and Caicos Islands, uh, a few years ago that CARICOM took a very strong stand against that. As a result of that, a similar move was contemplated with the British Virgin Islands, and the British have decided to allow the people of the BVI to resolve their problems, and we think that that's a proper thing to do. So uh, it's, it's clear that Bahamas and CARICOM have a watching brief on those, uh, on those territories, because uh, democracy is an important aspect to us, and a number of uh, countries, the uh, colonies of the Netherlands and uh, France, uh, are also trying to become members of CARICOM. And so there's a watching brief on all those countries uh, as well. Anything else? I would say that we want to have uh, the broadest participation of the Bahamian public in this, and um, I didn't get to, uh, to announce this in the House because some people were banging on the desk, so they couldn't hear. Uh, so I'm going to say it now. Um, each member of Parliament uh, has 10 invitations open to them, uh, so they should contact the Cabinet Office uh, or um, the Office of the Prime Minister for the delivery of those invitations to just give to their constituents who'd like to attend the various uh, uh, public functions like the state reception uh, and the opening uh, on Wednesday evening. So it's 10 each um, so that you know, ordinary citizens can have an opportunity for each member of parliament and each senator, by the way. So uh, they should be encouraged to collect those invitations and give them to people who would like to attend. There is de facto a government, but de jure, what's happened is that the uh, parliamentary authority for the government has expired. And uh, there doesn't seem at this point to be an end in sight as to when elections are going to take place to give the uh, legal support for and constitutional support for a government. So in this sense, you can describe the government there as an interim administration. Uh, who are de facto running the government, but their job is to get the country to, to uh, elections. Um, and that's, that's what all of the, the discussions will take place, is how do we provide a safe environment for elections to take place uh, in Haiti. Thank you, thank you. Eyewitness, you got what you needed? Yes, Mr. Mitchell, I did. All right, thank you. Well, as I understand it, uh, the judge's ruling indicates that uh, the government has now got the legal framework to proceed to deal with the matter. 
And what happens next has to do with the agencies of the government, like social services and uh, the Ministry for Immigration and the Ministry of Works, to work together uh, to ensure that what is carried out is lawfully carried out. Uh, well, we don't support vigilante justice. Uh, you can't support it, and uh, the law should be followed. We are a country of laws and rules, and we have an international reputation and a domestic reputation to obtain. What is important at this juncture is that civil society in our country needs to speak to, uh, to the reinvention, if you will, of the age of reason. Um, the fact is the institutions of this country are not in crisis. Uh, the institutions of the country are working well and doing the job that those institutions were designed to do and which uh, job they have in law. Those institutions should be allowed to do their work uh, without fear or favor. I know they're capable and up to doing it and uh, the law is going to be followed and the law should not be taken into private hands. Uh, I can't say that there's evidence that they were in danger. They're in the Bahamas. They were withdrawn by order of the Prime Minister because of an incident, a spe specific incident, which happened with the Haitian National Police when there was a protest, which was also a protest against the interim government in Haiti. So with the help of the Dominican Republic, they were withdrawn. And when the, we're not going to make an announcement r about them returning for security reasons, uh, the Bahamas has to have a presence in uh, Haiti uh, for diplomatic and security reasons. Um, so that will continue to be. The question of when they return will be a judgment made by the security people and uh, the Prime Minister with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs as to when it is um, uh, important for them to go back, important and safe to go back. The diplomats themselves, I think they express this view to the public, were not themselves alarmed because uh, Haiti is a situation which ebbs and flows. Uh, and, uh, but in this country, the government deemed it prudent for them to be withdrawn, and that's the reason why they were brought home. Do you know if there are any other reasons for Haiti trying to get out? Oh, well, commercial flights continue to go into Haiti, and I don't know whether they're trying to get out. I can't mm -hmm. speak for what private citizens want to do. Uh, what I understand is the commercial traffic by Bahamas Air into Port-au-Prince has ceased, but that's largely not because of the security situation, but because of marketing conditions. The market is really in Cape Haitian, and I think those flights continue as, as far as I'm aware. Uh, there's a huge market for uh, travel uh, <coughs> within the two countries and, uh, and commerce, and uh, I suppose as, so as long as those markets are obtained, uh, it'll be possible. What we're trying to do <coughs> is to make sure that the decisions we make are rational, and not irrational, um, that they uh, favor uh, good relations in the short, the medium, and the longer term, and that uh, our reputation, both at home and abroad, remains intact. And uh, that requires a level head, uh, judicious decisions, and rational interpretations of what's happening. And it is a tough job in this environment, but um, there have to be grown-ups in the room, and those grown-ups have to apply uh, the lessons of rationality. And that's where we are. Um, I know you mentioned the Office of the Dominican Police a little bit. Are there any plans to send some human law enforcement officers to help keep peace in Haiti to bring a sense of unity to all of the bitter against well, I, I don't know who's bitter against it or not. I'm saying the government has publicly announced, publicly announced, as, as many as six months ago, when we were asked, the Bahamas plans to supply manpower to any f uh, intervention force that is um, supported or authorized by the United Nations. And we did it before, and it's likely to be done again. That's where we are.